before I begin, I want to make sure everybody knows I got permission to share it. So uh, one of our Journey Go uh, leaders who leads our ASP uh, kind of uh, uh, teams, and uh, he also serves here as one of our key leaders. He helps our, po- our, our parking and host uh, teams out there. The last few months he's been battling leukemia, uh, and the battle continues, but they were really, really praying, and especially through the 21 days of prayer, um, and a lot of people that knew this were praying for him, uh, that he would not have to have a bone marrow transplant. That would not be something that they would uh, deal with. And on the very last day of the 21 days of prayer, he received notification, and the doctor said that according to his bone marrow, there's no sign of leukemia in his bone marrow, which is a huge answer to prayer. And uh, so if you would continue to pray for Mike and Melissa Davids, that he's still got to go through some uh, continual treatment, but that's a huge, huge answer to their prayer in terms of uh, what their future looks like and what they're going to continue to to do to manage this. So we're really, really excited for that. He sent a text, and um, we just all were worshiping and celebrating this morning. So I I got permission to share it with... First service didn't get to hear this. It's just for you. Uh, I got permission to share it with you guys. So um, again, we are... Uh, This is Journey Go Weekend, which is our global outreach emphasis. We do this maybe once a year, once every year and a half. We just take a Sunday and just talk about it. We just talk about our partnerships, and we talk about all the reasons and the the opportunities we have. Um, Where we're going to go today, because I always have to approach this a little differently every every time I talk about it, because, you know, you may not remember what I said, but I I remember what I said, so I got to keep it fresh for me, you know. Uh, I want us to answer these two questions. These are the ones that I really kind of feel like uh, are going to be the most important questions for you. First and foremost is, why would you go? And the second is, why do we, why do we as a church partner? And, and if you take away the historical context of sort of missionaries in your mind, or if you grew up in church, you know, the idea of mission trips, if you took away sort of the context of the church, the, the, the question is, is a good question. You have to answer this for yourself. Why would you go? Like, why would you give up vacation time, right? Why would you give up vacation time and go to some of the poorest regions of the world? Why would you go and instead of, you know, being your vacation, you stay in a nice hotel and eat the food you want to eat and, you know, kind of see the things you want to see? Why would you choose to go sleep in, you know, bunks? And why would you go choose to be a part of a, of a group of people? Yikes. You know what I'm saying? Like, why would you choose to do that? Why would you choose to be a part of someone else's schedule? Why would you choose to serve and volunteer with people that uh, you don't know? They don't know you. You're probably not going to see them again. So you have to literally kind of walk through that. Like, why would you ever choose to go? Why would you do that? And the second is, why would we partner? And that's, that's just a big question for us as a church. And that, some people actually ask this question. Like, do we not have enough things that we have to do as a church here that we need to spread ourselves thin and spend money and budget things to go outside of this community? Like, do we not have enough vision already for, for uh, Huntersville and the Lake Norman region and all the people we want to point to absolute hope? And do we not have enough things to, that we could spend money on, that we could serve people in here? Why would we choose? Like, why would it be a choice, an intentional choice for us to give out of our budget? For us to raise additional funds throughout the year for projects and for travelers. Why would we do this and partner with people from, you know, in parts of our, in the United States that are, that are suffering and across the world, people who are suffering and have needs? Why would we do that? And you may have never asked those two questions, but I really feel like in order for you to take the responsibility that really God wants to place in you, in order for you to even ever take a step towards being a part of Journey Go, you're going to have to answer these two questions for yourself. Why in the world do we as a church financially partner and give of ourselves? And why would you, you, choose to go? Now, as a church, just to let you know, some, kind of some backstory. The, our, our strategy when it comes to local and global missions is very, very simple. You've heard me say this for a few years. It's share and serve. Everybody say it out loud. Share and serve. That's our strategy. And a couple of years ago, I shared kind of the, 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 if you would, a contrast of that, especially when it came to missions, this idea of go and see and why that's so different than share and serve. And it's really funny. I, 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 we had a comedian that we brought in 
at the beginning of this year to, uh, to, take, uh, to, to raise some money for local charities. And uh, he came and shared, and he had this little tiny section about mission trips. And if you've been a part of churches before, you're going to immediately know what he's talking about. But I wanted you to watch this real quick as we talk about what does go and see really mean and what does it look like. Let's watch this together. But another one of my Facebook friends just got back from a mission trip to Kenya, and I'm pretty sure her mission was to take as many selfies with little African kids as possible. And she nailed it. Uh, I think she got the whole village. Well, you know, it turns out the real mission for the trip was to dig a well, which is ridiculous, because none of these 20 college-age Americans have ever dug a well here. This church is just going to send them across the globe like they're these world-renowned well-digging consultants. <laughs> just going to show up and know exactly what to do. And, you know, I don't want to be critical. Maybe Kelly and her sorority sisters <laughs> were extremely competent well-diggers. <laughs> but last time I checked, selfie sticks don't come with shoveling attachments. And if your makeup is still perfect at the end of the day, you probably didn't hashtag make a difference. So, I don't know. Wow. We all hate mission trips. It's good to know. I hate mission trips, but if you've been around sort of the church world, you, you'll kind of understand why it is he says that, because there is an element of some short-term uh, mission trips in terms of the church world that uh, tends to be like this. It tends to be very much like what we're talking about in terms of a go-and-see strategy and mentality versus what our intention is. So the biggest difference for you, just to let you know, go and see is simply the idea of you're going to experience something new. You choose to go outside your comfort zone and experience something new for the first time. And, uh, and then you observe it. You kind of see what the differences are. You kind of compare it to where, you know, you versus where you're, what you're seeing. Uh, you maybe take some pictures. Maybe you document it a little bit. And, and then you come home. Right? And, that, and that becomes just one of your many, many memories in life in terms of, of one of the experiences you have. That, to me, is, a, is kind of a go-and-see philosophy. In church world, it's kind of like volunteerism, right? Uh, that's kind of the, the way it's described. And we, we all do this. We do this when we go to the zoo. We do this when we go to a museum. You know, we do this when we go to a new vacation spot. So we have a new vacation spot, and you've never been there before. And so you are going to go and see, and you're going to have all these amazing experiences. And there's some people, let's just be honest, that have gone through mission trips and have gone to things before, and quite frankly, their, their intent and, and really the result was they went somewhere they'd never been before, they got outside their comfort zone, they saw some things that were different, they took some pictures, we're not against pictures, you know, took some pictures and they returned home and it really just became an experience of their past. And we believe, this is, this is us as a church, that we are called to share and serve. And the reason we go locally and globally to do this is because we believe that when we share of ourselves and we share the gospel and we share uh, finances and resources and we share of ourselves, we are going to have a transformation in us. When we serve others, when we put others' needs ahead of our own, we're doing exactly what God called us to do, and we're going to see some change and transformation in us. You can go and see and have an experience in your past. I don't believe you can share and serve without actually experiencing change in your life, whether that's locally or globally. Here's some scripture that kind of backs up the way we believe this. To share, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses, telling people everywhere, telling about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, where you live, in Judea, in your region, in Samaria, with the people you don't want to go to. And he said, even to the ends of the earth, you're called to share. Goes on to say as well, the th- I love this, Paul says this to the church in Thessalonica, he says, we loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but, but our own lives too. Like it's such a big deal to not just share the good news of Jesus with others, but we share us with people. Part of that's how we serve and The serve verses, you've seen these before. Dear children, let's not merely say that we love one another, but let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. 
continues in Galatians, he says, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but do not use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature, but instead use your freedom to serve one another in love. This is all a part of our church, again, our strategy to share and serve. And that's what we really do believe is different. We don't do everything perfectly as a church. We never will. But we want to enter these things with the right motives. We want to do these things with the right heart and the right strategy. That when we go and when we partner and when we lock arms with organizations, we, you know, with, whether it's uh, Paz Esperanza and the Hovey House in Peru and you know, the Kagoras Project in Kenya and the Appalachian Service Project in, in the Appalachian Mountains of, 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 of this country and, and then you know, to Haiti with Mission of Hope. Like, why do we do this? Well, we do it because we feel like God's called us clearly to share and serve. Now, when it goes back to the question we ask, I'm going to start with the second question first because that's just the way I want to do it. We're going to start with the second question first. Why do we as an organization partner with other organizations and other churches across the world to accomplish things there in addition to continuing to still have a heart to accomplish things here? Well, we really do believe that the example is given to us in the New Testament. From the first church, from the first believers of the way, in terms of their missionary efforts and what they chose to do. And that has been a model that the church has followed for 2,000 years. That the churches will always band together to serve other churches and other organizations to meet the needs where they are. Quick, a couple examples I'll give you. Um, I told you when, the, when Jesus gave the commission, he says, you're going you're gonna to be my, my witnesses in Jerusalem. Well, at the time, the church was born there, right? It was born in Jerusalem. But after a period of time, Jerusalem became under, under Rome and under the religious le- Jewish leaders, it became such a, a persecuted hardship for them to serve there that the church, the heart, the epicenter of the church actually moved to Antioch and then to some few other places. So now Jerusalem had become a mission field. They were actually sending people back to serve and to help those who were in persecution in Jerusalem. Here's Paul giving some of that examples of what this looked like. This is him to the Corinth church. He's telling the Corinth church, he says, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God and his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia, in this region. They're being tested by many troubles, and they're very poor, but they also are filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it of their own free will. I mean, it wasn't coerced. It wasn't, you know, guilt and shame. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing, right? That's a privilege. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing and the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. And they even did more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and then to us, just as God wanted them to do. If you skip down to verse 17, he continues on this theme of what's happening. He says, Titus welcomed our request that, to visit you again. And as a matter of fact, he himself was very eager to go and see you. We are also sending another brother with Titus. All the churches praise him as a preacher of the good news. He was appointed by the churches to accompany us as we take the offering to Jerusalem, a service that glorifies the Lord and shows our eagerness to Help. You see this example of where not only was money sent, not only was money given, but people were sent to help and to assist in the missionary efforts, in, in the front lines, if you will, of right at that time was Jerusalem. And these churches weren't, you know, the wealthy of the wealthy. Matter of fact, he says, the churches of Macedonia that were involved in this, they were struggling. These are the churches that were having, had, had their own hardships, but they counted it a privilege to share in this gift and share in the opportunity to to serve the church and to serve the organization where there was a greatest need. And I'll be honest, for us as a church, we've I've been the lead pastor here now for I think eight years. And in that eight year period of time where we've really kind of established some some good partnerships within our journey go, um, we we have some ups and we've had ups and downs, even financially as a church, but that's never stopped us from com- fulfilling our commitments globally to our partners. It's never stopped us from raising money for local, for local needs and for global needs. Because again, we counted a privilege to be able to do this as a church. I'll tell you a little bit more why in a minute. 
Later on in the next chapter, he continues to challenge the Corinthian church to join, to join the churches in this missionary effort, to join the churches to help Jerusalem. So he goes on to say, God's the one who provides you the seed for the farmer, then bread to eat, in the same way he'll provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when you take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. Paul says two things happen. These two good things result from the ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all the believers who prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. There's things, there is a result of this. There's a, there's a payout, if you will, a payoff. There always is when you're obedient to God. Is that, hey, this is going to happen. The needs are going to be met because of your efforts, because you join in this, this effort with us. And then people are going to really give the acknowledgement to God. They're going to give the glory to God and the thanks to God. Now, Paul himself was a missionary. So many times, Paul himself was the recipient of, if you will, of needing uh, the churches to support him in order to do the work he's called him to do and, and be in the places he's called, because, you know, things weren't always great for Paul. And he tells the church in Philippians early on, he says, you know, this is what you did for me, and he, I want you to see what he says about even the church's, you know, benefit, if you will, of serving Paul. Paul was in Rome at the time. He was in jail. And he gives this kind of letter to the Philippians. He says, as you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news, and then traveled on to Macedonia. No other church did this. This is before all the other churches joined in. He says, even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want to, you know, a gift from you. He's not trying to butter them up. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all that I need and more. I'm generously supplied with the gifts you sent, uh, sent me with uh, Epaphrodit- Epaphroditus. He says, they are, they are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. He, he wanted them to understand that this is, this is a reward to those who, who understand the work, who choose to partner. There's a, it's a sacrifice, yes, but it's a sacrifice that pleases God when you are a part of this this really example and process of partnering with and loving one another and serving one another as we do, even as a church currently, right now, after all these examples around the world. Now, some of the opportunities, I'll just share them with you really quickly that we have coming up in the next couple of years for you to take advantage of. We have 47 opportunities happening this year in 2020. 33 are available today, starting today. That's why we have tables out in the lobby and folks there to to answer your questions. We'll have 70, and I believe even a little bit more, opportunities next year. This year we have some unique things happening uh, right now that's available today. We have in our spring break, normally we go to Haiti with our uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers and families of middle schoolers and high schoolers. We normally go to Haiti, but Haiti's been in such turmoil that we, they're not accepting those kind of trips. Don and I still plan to go and continue to serve the pastors there this year. But this year, during our spring break and during the, school, the kids' school spring break, we're taking them to the Appalachian Service Project. They have a unique program for them for us to serve there. And so that's something I would really challenge you and your middle schoolers and high schoolers to be a part of. And if you as a family member need to be a part of that with them, then take the time off and be a part of it with them. That's an opportunity that we now have for you this year. We're also going back to Peru. And you, if you've heard us talk about Peru before, um, we serve at a shelter there for, those, for girls that have been abused sexually. And, and um, we provide legal care and psychological care. And the shelter provides shelter and, and, and rest for them. And then uh, there's an organization that they partner with where we go down and serve the organization and serve the staff there. And we have two projects actually happening. We have the, the normal project where we go and serve the girls and the staff and, and be a part of that program. And then we also have a project um, unique in terms of the Paz Esperanza has an opportunity to build some smaller kind of bungalow shelters, not only for people to stay in for their, you know, in terms of their uh, sustainability, but also for families of the girls who want to come and see their children, who want to come and see their family members but don't have a place to stay. 
And so they want to build these little bungalows to help them as well. And so we're actually going to go, and that, maybe that's something that you're uniquely skilled at to go and be a part of. So we're sending a team down there with two kind of purposes this year for the bungalows and for the shelter to do an incredible work in Peru. And you can sign up for that today. You can ask the questions about that today. We'll be going back to ASP later on in the fall this year. So we have many opportunities for you to help. If you're praying through those opportunities and you want, you're, you know, you, God's placed some things on your heart next year, we do plan to go back to Haiti. And we do plan also to go back to Kenya. We just went to Kenya in 2019 and we plan to return and be a, continue to be a part of the Kogoris Project and serving the Kogoris town area there in Kenya. So if that's something you'd like to have interest in, they will answer those questions for you today. The opportunities are here. They're available because we as a church, we have answered the question that we feel like it is critical for us to partner with these organizations and to continue to not only give funds, but to send people. But that leads us to the second, the first question, which is why would, why would you go? Why would you go? Why would you give your time? Why would you give of yourself? Why would you give your energy? Why would you spend the time it would take to raise the funds? Why would you choose to put yourself in that position? If you don't understand that share and serve concept, like why would you go? Well, there's lots of reasons, and I've shared lots of reasons over many years, but there's three, three reasons that I really feel like God gave me for this message to share with you today. Three things that I think really do make the difference in terms of answering that question for you, of why you would go. And it's perspective, accountability, and purpose. Let's talk about your perspective for a minute. We're going to kind of interchange perspective and perception because your, perspe your perception really does affect the perspective that you have. And here's the reality. Our God is a global God. I love this quote from John Scott who says, we must be global Christians with a global vision because our God is a global God. You know, even when Jesus said it, and go back to Jesus' words in Acts, he says, you will be my witnesses. You're going to tell people about me everywhere. And he was careful to help them understand the map, right? It's not just your family. It's not just your neighbors. It's not just your community. It's your community. It's your region. It's the people you don't necessarily want to go to, people who don't look like you, who don't think like you, who don't agree with you. And it goes all the way to the ends of the earth. That, that is our, that, that should be our perspective, but the reality is, is that, listen, you don't know what you don't know, okay? You don't. You don't know what you don't know. If all you know is this, then that's all you know. That's your perspective. If all you know is your family and your home and this community and your, your experiences in your life and you've never been anywhere else and you've never <laughs> experienced the opportunity to go share and serve others across the world, then you just don't know. You do not have the perspective that you need. Sometimes our perception, again, plays its role because I love this quote from Mark Patterson that says, you know, sometimes you need a change of pace and a change of place to get that change of perception. The what you see. And this is another reason why I believe, guys, seriously, that you need to encourage your middle schoolers and your high schoolers to be a part of Journey Goes mission trips, okay? And if you, listen, I'm not saying send them. I'm saying you take them. You go with them, okay? And because, listen, at the end of the day, how many have heard the term first world problems? Nod your head if you've heard that, right? Okay? And most of the time, Christians say it, and they're being jerks about it, so don't be a jerk about it, okay? But you know what? You, you have to have the right perspective, right? The right perception. You have to have that because, you know, every once in a while you just need to understand that when the Wi-Fi goes out, it's not that big a deal because it is a first world problem. And our kids need to know it and we need to know it if we don't already know it. I'll tell you, last year, uh, 
We had some folks go to Kenya. We had a great. Uh, we had some some grandfathers who went with us uh, uh, to Kenya. We had some young young singles come with us and go to Kenya. And in both ranges, the experiences last year were amazing because one of the things that continued to change was their perspective. Over and over again, we'd hear people say, I didn't know it was going to be like that. I didn't know it looked like this. Some of them even said, I didn't know it was going to smell like this, right? I didn't know I was going to feel like this. This is critical for you to go. To change that perspective, that, your perception, and to have it alter your perspective. So that you can begin, not just, to, again, not to be a jerk with the first world problem stuff, but to, but to constantly come home and remember that this is not all there is to the work of God. This is not all there is to the kingdom of God. This is not all there is for us to be sharing and serving in. The second is accountability. The second is accountability because we are held accountable for the way in which we've been blessed. The reality is we live in the, some of the richest suburbs, the richest, richest areas of the world, and the richest nation in our world. And you may not consider yourselves all that blessed and all that rich, but you are. Again, perspective, you are. We are. Paul tells through Timothy that this is part of what we've been commanded to do. He goes on and says, tell them, and he's saying them is a reference to verse 16, which is those who are rich in this world. He said, I want you to tell them to use their money to do good, and they should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being willing to share with others. Keep going. By doing this, they will store up their treasures as a good foundation for their future so that they may experience true life. And now you've heard us teach on this, and we'll teach more on it again, I'm sure. But generosity is the key to experiencing the fullness of life. And maybe you haven't, you haven't understood this yet. You haven't gotten there yet. Part of it's probably your perspective. But, but generosity is a part of this. You know, Jesus taught many parables to help us understand the accountability that we are going to have to answer for, whether or not we are being a good steward of all that we've been blessed with, of all that we've been given. But James, who's the brother of Jesus, he was not known for mincing words. He was called James the Just. James ratchets it up just a little bit more in terms of the accountability that we are held to. James says, look here, you rich people. That's always a good way to start, right? Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles that are ahead of you. And he's talking to a very specific group of people. Your wealth is rotting away, and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and your silver are corroded, and the very wealth you're counting on will eat away at your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. If you skip down to verse 5, it says, You've spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire, but you fatten yourself for the day of slaughter. Now again, context. They, they would have understood this. Because back then there's no refrigeration, there's no, you know, you, that's a word they would have understood. You know, when they, when they had a party coming up, a wedding coming up, a celebration coming up, they would usually have uh, one of their animals, they put one of their animals to the side, and then they'd, when they fed the animals, they would give that animal a double portion. And they would begin to fatten that animal up. You know, fatten that animal. Now the animal thought, man, this is luxury. You know, the, the animal was like, I'm high on the hog, right? Unless it's a hog. But anyway, that's, that's the, that was the animal, unbeknownst to them, that they are being fattened up for the day of slaughter. And James says, look, and listen, you can use a lot of these verses to put guilt and shame on people, and that is not, I don't believe that's even James's heart. James is just very clear. We are accountable for what we've been given. And when you do not use what you've been given for the purposes that God gave it to you, and it's all about you. It came to you and it's all about you. I can promise you the stuff, the money, the material possessions, all that you've hoarded, all that you've counted on will one day testify against you. I don't want that to be the case for my life. I don't want that to be the case for my family. 
that we want to be able to enjoy the life that God's given us. We, want to, we are so incredibly blessed, but it's been a part of the discipline in our life early on to give back and to give away and to support and to give and to understand part of this is our opportunity, our privilege to share and serve with those in need because we have been so richly blessed. I don't want my stuff to testify against me when I'm accountable to God. The third is purpose. And if you were here last week, um, you know, this is going to be a part of just the sermon last week as it continues on, because I just still believe this is a big deal in terms of why do we go? Why would you go? Because it aligns with your purpose. And if you've struggled to understand your purpose, and as we talked about last week, running the race that God's called you to, you'll see again Paul's language here (laughs) when he talked about that now he was compelled by the Spirit, he was going to go to Jerusalem, not knowing what would happen to him there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. And yet he was still going to go. Why? I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may, read the words out loud, finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Purpose. Purpose. That's why we share and serve. That's why we go. Because we have been given a task. Regardless of the details of your race and my race, it all has the same purpose. To share with others the gospel of grace. To point everyone to the absolute hope of Jesus Christ. And I, I love this quote from Bob Goff, who was a lawyer and he had a huge transformation in his life. And he said, look, I used to be afraid of failing at something that really mattered to me, but now I'm more afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. He said, there was this transformation in him. I said, I used to be afraid of, I used to be afraid of the the things that I would fail at in this world that I thought made a difference. But now I'm really afraid, more afraid, if you would, of succeeding at things that don't make a difference to anyone. That's why our purpose exists. I cannot answer these two questions for you. You have to answer these questions. I mean, I can tell you from an an intention part why we partner, but you're never going to give money to this church and give money to projects and be a part of the bigger picture if you don't understand why we collectively as a church partner and do that. You're never going to know why you should go. If you don't feel the weight of that accountability, if you don't understand the benefit of of having the perspective that God wants you to have in this life and knowing how it aligns with your purpose. But I can't can't force it on you. It's something you have to answer for yourself. I'd love to share. I didn't, I kind of purposely didn't share a ton of stories today and And some other things that, I mean, I've got tons of stories from people who've gone on trips before, but I did want to share this one and let let one of our partners share with you the experience that she had the last Journey Go Sunday that we had here as a church. Let's watch this together. It was one of those... um trips that we always said we would do Um, one day. We would do a Journey Go trip. Um, Not necessarily Peru, but one day we would do a Journey Go. Um, And I remember um, that it was December 2018 um, and we, um, you know, get those peak emails that come out midweek and I knew that um, Journey Go Sunday was coming, Global Outreach Sunday. And um, I remember thinking that morning, you know, I'm going to go because that's what we do on Sundays, but this doesn't apply to me. This isn't my, um, this isn't the year for this. Um, sermon that day, um, you led, Matt, with um, how often do you say no, maybe, or one day? And I was like, that's, that is, that is me. That is, we will either say, well, most of the time we weren't saying no. I was always either saying maybe or one day. Um, and it really, on paper, it was not the year for us to go. Um, we had young kids. I was going through medical treatments. 
um, wasn't quite sure how we would do the fundraising. Um, our summer was hectic already. There really, when you looked at the logistics, it wasn't the year to say yes. But um, by the time I left that service, um, not only was I signing up for a trip, but I was signing up for Peru. I, I felt God saying that is exactly where I needed to be. And that day I wrote a check um, for our deposit and I wasn't quite sure where the rest of it was coming. I remember turning to Adam um, at the end of the service and saying, um, I'm going to Peru. I, I hope you'll go with me, but I'm going no matter what. Um, it was that certain in my mind. There were, in the months that passed between December and June when we um, got on the bus to go to the airport, um, I never really doubted that decision and I kept waiting. It, it would be like my personality for um, all of the details to, to worry me and to um, continue to be concerned about, you know, where are my kids going to be that week and what's going to be going on? And those things fell into place and um, I just, I felt so much peace with that decision um, and that's before I even got to see the girls' faces in Peru. And once I did, um, it was it, it was life changing, and um, when we got on the plane to return home, I I remember turning to our coordinators and saying, "I'm only going to get on that plane if you promise me that as soon as possible I can know when we can return." Um, and it was it was probably the best thing that I've ever done. So I want you to not leave today with a a no, a maybe, or a someday. Um, it may not be yes today, but I don't want you to put it off. I don't want you to just put it out of your mind because you've got all the excuses in the world why that's not the right time for you. Ask the questions, engage in the conversation, pray. Don't let this just be another Sunday or even a time in which, uh, I love this quote from uh, David Livingston who served in Africa, that sympathy is no substitute for action right? I don't want you to, to feel bad. I don't want you to, to have an emotion, but not do anything with it. I want you to pray about it, and I want you to ask the questions you need to ask. That's why we do it. That's why we have all the volunteers that are going to be out there to help you today. Maybe figure out if this is a step you need to take, and take it even this year. Let's pray together. Father God, we're so thankful that you've called us to share of ourselves, to share our resources, to share you, Jesus, with the world. It's a privilege to be a part of the, the, the ministry of giving to others. We're thankful you've called us to serve, not just serving one another, but, but, but letting it be the thing that shows everyone else that we, are, we, we don't just love and say it, we actually show it that we're rooted in truth, that we actually believe that it's true, and we obey what you've called us to do. You said that the world would know that we belong to you because of how we love one another. So Jesus, today I'm, I'm praying just for the, the room full here at Journey that you would be moving in our hearts, not to create sympathy for us to put it aside, a, a maybe or a one day or that'd be nice, but, but God, that we would pray and investigate and, and, and obey what your prompting is in our hearts take the steps to ask the questions and to get the information about what this would look like to go and share and serve. Jesus, we pray all this in your name. Amen.